Okay, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is the domestic violence policy. And <clears throat> um, Miriam and I, uh, over a year ago, <laughs> started working on this policy. And it came up because um, I think it showed up at PPRB and it was obviously a policy that needed a lot of work. And we thought that it would be really interesting to see how the system worked with a policy that was not CASA related. And so this was the policy. All right, so well, here we are a year later. All right, and when we started this, I, mean, I need to give you some history on it because it's, it gives you a glimpse of this process and what's going on and not happening and not happening. So what we did, we, we started off by going to the Family Resource Center and talking to Scott. He recommended someone else we talked to. We ended up going to the, domestic, the National Domestic Violence Network. We got the best policies that they recommended, which was the state of Maryland and Santa Clara, California Sheriff's Department. And so from those two policies, we ended up starting to rewrite the existing policy and trying to put in, in the appropriate places, um, missing ingredients in our domestic violence policy. And uh, in that process, we continue to get information from other people and we talk to um, people in the sex crimes unit. We went and talked to the rape crisis people. Um, we talked to Major Tyler in training in order to try to, you know, have a full um, bag of information, you know, that, to go forward. Uh, so we, it got rewritten and uh, Miriam typed it all up and tried to make it um, readable. And so we presented it to open. We filled out the required paperwork, the right paragraphs, the research, everything. Turn it into OPA, and they say, oh my golly, this is major. What we need to do is have a task force. And that, that made sense. So now it's like eight or 10 meetings of the task force later. And I'm here to report that nothing we recommended was added to the domestic violence policy. Um, and I, I'll tell you what we recommended. But um, in the process, the, um, <laughs> uh, the McClellan lawsuit got mixed up in this. And this was a lawsuit that started in the 90s, had to do with the treatment of people with mental illness in our in BCDC at that point. And so uh, when the CASA came along, um, Peter Cooper's office, who had been involved in the McClellan lawsuit, became also a party involved in MRAC. And they identified five um, APD policies that had a lot to say about mental illness. So they started then also coming to the meeting. Peter Cooper managed to come to three meetings himself Katie, uh, who works in his office, uh, Katie Lowe, came to two other meetings. So the, it was really um, uh, a lot of back and forth about just making the, the change of whether we will or shall or may arrest people um, at a time of a, a domestic violence dispute. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm getting confused between domestic violence and mental health, so. So the mental health people um, that Peter rep represented right. um, were, um, he felt that they were not being treated free, um, fairly by the language that was in our domestic violence okay. policy and four other so APD to the policies. That somebody involved in a domestic violence case also has a mental health Right. Issue. Yeah. There, there, that was his concern. That was his concern. So, and and also the the um, the national law, um, the act on um, domestic violence, says that you may arrest. It does not say you will or shall. But anyhow, it still took um, all these meetings with all these folks, even to get that word changed. And believe me, we were asking for more to get changed and um, nothing did. 
So um, what I what happened is that uh, really really hardworking APD people came to meeting after meeting, and we went over this whole policy word by word, line by line, concepts some days, no concepts other days. However, people participated and. I guess in some ways we all wasted a lot of time because nothing changed. Um, so, and, and frankly, I was the only one there interested in making these other changes. And there was uh, a reason that nothing would ever work. And I'm not gonna go into that. It's just, it was reason after reason. They were fascinating reasons, but anyhow. So what happened is that um, we were in you know, an impasse. I mean, there's no way that anything was going to change in the policy outside of what Peter's group got changed. And so um, Bill Slauson says to me yesterday, he said, you know, those conversations are sort of informal and, you know. So what, what POB needs to do is to write a letter to the chief and make our uh, requests formal and then maybe some changes might happen in the policy. He initiated this conversation? Yes. So, um, I want to tell you what the changes are that we're, uh, we've been suggesting from our research on best practices. And the changes have to do with an investigation that is not in the policy. And Looking through national policies, I've just I've read New York City, the state of the state of North Carolina. Um, oh, I have them all here: Pittsburgh, um, Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada, Seattle, um, You've L.A. Read a lot of I mean, I, I, plus the original Maryland and um, uh, the Santa Clara Sheriff's Department. And, and investigation is really an important part of a domestic violence policy. And the, the argument has been that APD does have two investigation policies, but neither of them talk about some of the fine points that are specific to the, the right type of investigation that is um, best practices nationally. Having two officers show up is, is one of the best practices. Separating people so they're not within hearing distance of one another during the investigation is another best practice. Um, uh, talking to children if they happen to be present is another best practice. Pittsburgh goes on to tell you in their policy the type of open-ended questions that an officer might use. Everywhere they talk about lethality assessment. And it is part of the um, narrative in the investigation by officers is to put in some type of lethality assessment. Some departments have 17 questions, some have 11, some, you know, it varies. Some call it lethality, some call it something else. But it's an assessment of how at risk the victim is. Well, anyhow, it doesn't go anywhere here. And then um, the third thing that um, uh, really have encouraged and it hasn't gone anywhere was that, that there are some special populations when there's domestic violence. And the special populations are APD employees. How is that case going to be handled? You have to, re, you know, uh, think through that. How is it going to be handled for this military? And what if it's a youth, um, th again, the rules are gonna be different. And so um, that was um, probably our third biggest request for changes. We had some other ones, but just stick with those. So what I'm here to propose at this point in time is that we do write a letter to the chief and put all the background data in that we've been talking about or we have available and uh, see how he responds and just see if anything changes on this policy. But for me, sitting there and all that time, I just came you know, to the conclusion that things don't change if there isn't a lawsuit. And just watching what happened with the 
the lawsuit and finally getting one word changed. But it, there's no lawsuit on this. It's just best practices. And forget it. Um, so, so you, but you think that writing a letter, I at least codify, at least writes down what our proposal is. Right. And as part of the letter, I would like to recommend that the chief come and explain his responses to these um, suggestions from us. Well, I, I have a, a, a little bit of experience in the yeah. domestic violence arena. Um, and having um, been the project director for the Family Advocacy Center, uh, was involved in its creation, conception, delivery, all of it. It's interesting to me that lethality in particular is amazing to me that that's not something that APD doesn't embrace because the, the best training I've ever seen was done by the author of a book on lethality in domestic violence situations written by who, the man who is on APD, Paul Syke, who is the commander of the Family Advocacy Center right now. Um, he was the head of the stalking unit when I was building the Family mm -hmm. Advocacy Center. Um, and the training that he provided to corporations around this town um, on lethality assessments in particular was stellar. It is recognized all over the place. So the fact that that's not part of the policy here mm -hmm. is po positively stunning. And it's yeah. been in policies around the country, some of them dating back 25 years ago. Okay. It's I'd not like it's a new you idea. The, I would ha be happy to help you write the letter. Thank you. I did go to some of the committee meetings, but they yeah. changed the date and I couldn't continue. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly agree with the suggestions that you have. I mean, if you really want you know, one of the things that the officers I've driven around with have complained about is going to the same domestic violence right. situation each time. Well, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, you're gonna you, you always you're gonna get what you always mm -hmm. got. Uh, separating the empowering the woman to speak, mm -hmm. uh, assuming the woman is the victim, which is most of the time. Um, separating those people is critically important because the victim is not going to speak in front of the perpetrator mm -hmm. under for good reason because she get the tar mm -hmm. beat out of her so um i would ha be happy to help you write that mm -hmm. letter um and make those suggestions and then okay. let's see where we go and a couple other things that just so the rest of you know that we would want to put in this list that aren't elsewhere is some kind of plan where there's photo uh, photographs of injuries taken like three days later or there's a actually they do that at the family advocacy center united way when you, i was there but such a slow a small percentage of uh, victims show up at the family advocacy center so there has to be a uh, some kind of safety net for that one and also the problem with the gun in the home if the gun was uh, used as part of a threat to someone. That That's all needs, part of lethality. It is, and, and we probably would have to have the DA help us with that one too because the resistance was really big on that. So, um, yeah, I and anyone else who wants to join Joanne and I, that would be great because we really where, need to keep this moving. Where, where would we find the policy that exists currently? Do you have the number of the... Uh um, I didn't bring. Is it in phone. there? I have a in, huge folder on it, and I, mean, I can't but tell it, you. It's in the it's in the in the SOPs. Uh, yeah, is yes, it, it is. Uh -huh. Okay, yes. Yeah. Would you send that information to Ed? Ed is just so those new members know. Ed is able to email all of us. We are not able to email each other. Okay, I would so. like to say I'd like to join you. When I work for the district attorney's office, I work two days a week in the DV unit. Oh, great! Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the know, three of us will get together and do that. Um, so would you send what, where that domestic violence current policy sure. is mm -hmm. to Ed, and then Ed can send it out to all of mm -hmm. us so we can take a look at it, okay? And we'll bring it back to the next meeting. Um, the letter? Yeah. I was wondering if we could meet in the interim. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. yes. And bring a final letter to bring the, a, to a the final board. final letter to the board at the next meeting. So